third eyelid sticking out. Uh, only put the eyelid in to keep Paul interested. He's got a bit of a an ophthalmology fetish, you see. So, um, so she's had various courses of antibiotics, including doxycycline. She's been on a fair bit of prednisolone and sort of almost a mig picky doses, and which sort of seemed to improve her demeanour, but certainly the discharge and the eye was looking worse and worse. By the time she um, she came to us, she had. Uh, obviously, the discharge and the third eyelid prolapse, she had quite a large submandibular lymph node. The, um, the vets at Gordon had cleverly aspirated that lymph node and sent that off to the, the laboratory who would identified cryptococcal yeast on the smears and, and the inflammatory response. The general blood showed, uh, reflected that inflammation. And what we did was submit the LCAT to, to confirm it's a crypto organism and get some kind of idea of the titer involved and uh, and do a CT scan. So this is just a generic Google image of um, cryptococcal yeast, but um, that would have been the kind of thing that they found at the lab. Um, she The neuro exam wasn't too remarkable. She was quite photophobic and I think she was probably quite painful and head shy when you ran, went around that eye. No ataxia or anything. Um, Paul kindly looked at the retinas and found a, a chorioretinitis lesion. Again, this this is not that dog. This is a, a cat, uh, but a chorioretinitis lesion was identified. So you know we kind of knew what was going on here. Um, she's you know got crypto. It's definitely in her nose. Now. I'll show the images in a sec, where she's got a massive um, lesion in the front of her nose. We've got to consider other differentials like other kind of um, causes of rhinitis, be them bacteria or atypical infections. Um, even lymphoma wasn't, wasn't out of the question. And interestingly, she also had a, a, a granuloma in her, her rostral brain. So I've got a few images here of her, her CT showing um, showing the images of her right uh, nasal cavities, kind of taking up the whole frontal sinuses there. And also there's a little bit of lysis of her, the cribriform plate was okay, um, but there's a bit of like, can you see my um, cursor here or not? Or do I need to get an arrow going? Yeah, anyway, we can see. You can see the cursor. Um, there's a little bit of lysis like, in the sphenoid bone there, and um, I suspect that's where the, the cryptococcal granuloma had extended into the cranial bulb. Frontal sinus full of um, probably the same bloody mucus we're seeing externally, and you can see this dorsal section of the brain there showing quite a large granuloma there. Um, and the sagittal section is also shown quite uh, quite contrast enhancing more rostrally and less so caudally. But yeah, quite a huge lesion there. And it, it's quite amazing how much brain dogs can function without. I'm continually amazed by that. Um, so we confirmed the LCAT. She's got a huge LCAT there. We've got something to work with. Um, we kindly enlisted the help of Dr. Malik, who's with us this evening about a treatment protocol. Uh, managed to get hold of a bunch of amphotericin. I have shared, uh, if any of you have trouble getting amphotericin, uh, a resident in Melbourne did some research on how to obtain it, but we, um, which I've shared with the group that came by Richard too, where MedSurg seemed to have it in stock again, which is convenient too. Um, now I haven't given her much intravenous dose. We kind of followed the subcutaneous protocol, ideally we would have done it three times a week. Uh, subcutaneously, you know, massively diluted as, as described. And um, you know, there were subsequent problems which I'll, I'll share in a minute. Now it's one of these nightmare scenarios when um, I, everything was fine. She'd had all, had all the procedures done in her treatment. And while I was explaining her the discharge instruction, she had a seizure in the consult room. So we, and this was, I think this was during COVID. So it was a massive drama to then readmit her and um, and pack her back in hospital to control the seizures. And she was started on phenobarbitone. Um, she'd been on a bunch of preds, so I didn't give her the dexamethasone off the bat. 
and we'd also planned to get her onto an azole, uh, so fluconazole, which was certainly planned to be long term. She was in with us for a few days. She seizures like a couple of times a day, not severe, more kind of some dorsal rigidity and opisthotonous, so not generalised, not a long generalised seizure by any um, stretch. Phenobarbitone, fluconazole, paracetamol and for pain, and we also used gabapentin for a little while and put her back on a, a low dose, so that was sort of 0.2 mg per kg per day of PRED, just to try and reduce some inflammation. Um, so we planned, well, ideally three times a week would have been great, but she became a little bit fractious in hospital and started to hate and resent us for the subcutaneous infusions. They did um, become painful after a while and she developed sterile abscesses. She didn't cope very well with quite a low dose of phenobarbitone. She was only gone two mix per kg twice a day and it was quite excessively lethargic and ataxic even after a week and at the owner's request we switched to the Kepra which um, seemed to control or help with the seizures and um, without the phenobarbitone side effects. She strangely develops incontinence after her treatment. It's not consistent. We thought it was volume related, but it even seems to happen whether we give her amphotericin, uh, you know, small amounts intravenously. We tried to compromise on the volume from 500 mils down to 350, which probably left it too concentrated and more likely to cause an abscess. But uh, interestingly, every time I give her amphotericin, she's incontinent. It's almost a, almost a protest pee on the carpet, I think. Uh, she seizured for a few weeks and, and nothing too severe. We did a follow-up LCAT at the owner's request um, not too long after, which we'd, we'd managed to halve it. So happy days. Um, where are we? So we managed to wean her off the pred and Kepra. We, she got a bit cranky. So the owner's been dosing with trazodone before she comes in. And um, we managed to, to get her treated that way, but the subcutaneous thing was just not working. The painful and abscesses, incontinence meds didn't really seem to help and it was so transient and incontinence. The, the great owner has, has learned to learned to live with it. So um, again, after discussing with Dr. Malik, um, we, and probably the main reason for sharing this case was that we've been doing intraperitoneal infusions for her of the, the amphotericin, same dilution. Um, I found, well, we had various combinations of catheters and we found that the best thing is she has a trazodone, she comes straight in and she's sweet when she comes in, we give her some Domitor just enough to uh, it's about 40 mics, so it's a per, per kilo, pretty solid dose, but just enough so she's a bit of a zombie. A bit of a clip and emla uh, around the umbilicus and using ultrasound guidance, they use an 18 gauge needle um, and just kind of pick the best spot for the infusion to go. It's, um, you know, we've got it down to a, a pretty quick process now and she's been pretty um, cooperative for us. However, after a while, the so I don't know what's up with the back and forth between slides. However, she does seem to get some peritonitis. It's, it's always sterile, like she has sometimes a bad day or two. You can kind of, I think Anna's done some for me and noticed that the peritoneum looks alarmingly thick and abnormal and it's sort of persistently like that. And then um, from time to time, we've had to give her a bit of a holiday for a week or two, but yeah, the intraperitoneal route seems to be working very effectively, where it's very well tolerated and on the most part seems to be improving and I've got some follow-up scans for you in a minute. She did, after another couple of months, develop a, a clinical sign. Someone's got a fair bit of chatter on their microphone. I don't know who that is. Uh, I can't. I'm just going to unmuting people if I if I'm seeing them unmuted. So if you want to contribute to the conversation, just unmute yourself, but then mute again once you're done. Um, so she had a bit of a recurrence. Um, she seemed to be reverse sneezing again, in particular, and snorting in the most foul way. She uh, her lymph node, which had regressed in size, seemed to seemed to enlarge again. 
her LCAT had worsened considerably, so it was sort of doom and gloom. Um, we found cryptococcal organisms in a lymph node. We attempted to, to culture this so that we could get some uh, MICs and kind of match that with the fluconazole dose. Unfortunately, we did get some Saburose agar in, but we, we couldn't seem to get any live organisms. So, so I guess I'm not sure whether that means there was live organisms there, certainly clinically, and the LCAT would suggest that there was a bit of a, a lack of response for a little while, but um, we didn't manage to get the... And the plan was for Vetnostic to submit that to Westmead for some culture and sensitivity data, but that never eventuated. So with further advice, we massively increased the fluconazole. We um, added in tibinifin as well. We considered doing our and CRIs, but um, we sort of run, in, run out of insurance for, from the dog. So the owner's sort of paying out of the pocket now. So we're trying to limit the cost a little bit. Uh, but she seems to be going really well at the moment. You know, happy as Larry. Uh, apart from a little setback after each amphotericin where she's incontinent, she's on a nice combination of fluconazole, tibinifin, and once or twice a week amphotericin. So we've got some other ideas in there uh, if, we, if we lose response, responsiveness. But as you can see from the scans, I've got a comparison from February, and this was yesterday. We've got a massive improvement from this huge... Um, uh, rhinitis there to today is a much smaller granuloma there and uh, you can see the comparison there as well. We've still got that sphenoid lysis which is sort of annoying, um, you know, still seems to be a bit of a breach in well calcified bone anyway between the nose and the brain but she's had no neurological signs whatsoever and doesn't seem painful at all. Also, um, pleasingly, that um, cryptococcoma in her rostral brain is massively reduced in size, so um, so that's got to got to be good news. Still got a long way to go, but um, you know, we've got a plan, and we're um, hopefully making progress. So, so it's not the most exciting case in the world, but we're just another frustrating crypto. But I thought the Images involving the brain and the nose are pretty interesting and the intraperitoneal amphotericin is something we haven't done before. Uh, thanks very much for Richard for all his advice and yeah, hopefully we'll have a pretty clear brain scan for you guys next year. And that's me done. So any questions or comments? Yeah, Dave, what uh, Dave did, it, did the dog lose its sense of smell? Uh, that's a good question. Yeah, I just, uh, she doesn't seem to like she's still interested in smells. How you kind of quantify it, I can't really tell. Interestingly, I was just talking to the owner Nikki yesterday, and she commented that the dog's a lot more obedient now. She used to be quite naughty and willful, and you know, she saw a bird or whatever, she wouldn't sit and stay, but now she does. She goes, "Yeah, okay, I'll do what I'm told." So I don't know whether we've sort of got a bit of a fungal frontal uh, lobotomy going on here for behavioural control, but um, probably not a recommended approach, but um, yeah, so I thought that was interesting. All right, so uh, there's no more. Sorry, I'm also interested in your use of PRED, and yes. I'm wondering the, the benefit of reducing inflammation versus um, immune suppression. Hmm. Yeah, um, so it's always, I guess, a bit uh, scary using well, immune, using an immunosuppressive drug in an infectious case, but I think particularly with crypto and the massive inflammation involved, I think it's really important to use initially to help settle down the inflammation and the meningitis that's involved. So I was a bit hesitant to start or to add further corticosteroids in this case, given that this dog had had been treated quite aggressively for a month or so with PRED before it came to me. So, uh, but I think as we killed off the, the cryptococcal organisms and 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 we had dead fungi and inflammatory products everywhere, I think it's really important to have some steroids in on board while it happened. And certainly, I only ever used an, an anti-inflammatory dose, so and only a pretty short term. So certainly. Hopefully not enough to you know, impede progress of treating the infection.
I agree with that, Dave. Um, I think uh, there's studies and people that suggest that the outcome in CNS crypto infections is improved by the short term use of yeah. doses of steroids. So I think that's where the idea came from as well. Yeah. Okay. Um, Dave, I had a question about how you're managing the case at the moment. Are you still doing the intraperitoneal amphotericin or are you just sticking yes. with clonazole now? Yeah, she's definitely, I mean, I'd like to give her more, but yeah, I don't want to well, break the bank or upset the dog too much. But yeah, she's coming in for once or twice a week amphotericin, you yeah, know, just with the trazodone, Dormator, and then a quick intraperitoneal infusion. She does sometimes develop a sterile peritonitis, so I do occasionally have to give her the week off, but um, yeah, she's definitely on intraperitoneal. So this dog, I don't know how badly other dogs tolerate the subcutaneous um, infusions, but she tolerates them so badly, it's miserable and painful for days afterwards, and so the owner wouldn't accept further subcutaneous treatment. So yeah, ongoing IP is, is the plan. Um. Uh, one other comment that I had on your case was that Richard's recently been suggesting the higher doses of the fluconazole, which you're using as well in this patient. So like the mm. 10 speaking twice daily of the fluconazole, yeah. I think that's a bit of a change from the literature. Um, yeah. but I found that quite successful in some of the patients we've been treating as well. Yeah, well, she seems to have gone back into, well, responding once we double the dose so almost double the dose so yeah and i guess if we do get a relapse we'd plan to try and culture some and do mrcs and you know i think um you know richard's implying we can use much higher doses potentially if necessary like even higher than 10 mix with gig BID. i think that's right richard is it yeah in, in in a perfect world if you culture it and you work out the mic and you do therapeutic drug monitoring where you do at least trough levels, and you want to get the trough levels five times higher than the MIC, that approaches the ideal. So it just depends whether you have a resistant C GATI or you've got a very susceptible C neoformans. It just, yeah. when treating all fungal disease, the value of measuring blood levels is really good, particularly when you know what your culture shows. But if you, treat a lot of dogs and a lot of cats, 10 mg pig twice a day um, is very much the type of dose that you should be aiming for. They normally cope with it fine. Mm. Yeah, so I think we started off a bit homeopathic and uh, a bit wussy, so I think we had to, to really up the ante to, to get a better response to the disease. So. Richard. Um, yeah. Sorry. Sorry, I was just going to ask, Richard, you know, in the US, the sort of distribution of neoformans and GATI uh, is quite sort of predictable or there's kind of clusters. Do we, do we see that or know that in Sydney or not? In, in Australia, the pattern is sort of like this. In, in, in Sydney or in Brisbane, 80% of the cases are seen neoformans, 20% mm -hmm. are see GATI VG1. VG1 is the one that's associated with eucalyptus trees. Mm -hmm. The complication is if you go to Perth, if you're Anna Teb or Mary Thompson or somebody like that, then in Perth they have a lot of VG2, which is a, a type of C. gatti that isn't associated with eucalyptus trees and is much harder to treat and tends to have higher MICs. So the distribution depends on where the dog comes from. If you go down to where Jeff Gibbons was at Charles Sturt University, there are all of the river red gums along the Murrumbidgee, so they get a lot of Cryptococcus gatti VG1. So it just depends on the particular area you live in. Okay, so mostly in Sydney it's near formants. 80%. Yep, interesting. All right. Well, thanks for input, Richard. We really appreciate it. Um, so, Paul, happy for Paul to go next, Anna. Yeah, Paul. Yep. So, yes, I'd like to introduce Paul McCarthy, our star intern, um, until Josh is, is just rising from the ranks. But um, Paul Skinner is being sucked into giving a talk, and um, so we need to be kind to him if, if you can. And um, take it away, Paul. All right, sweet. Um, thanks, guys. Uh, thanks for 
spending your evening listening to me. Uh, let me just try and figure out how to share my screen. One second. Okay. All right. Is that is that the PowerPoint or no? No. Not yet. Just go to go to start start show. Turn it off. Sorry, I forgot how to use the PowerPoint. That's it. Sweet. All right. Um, all right. Thanks, guys. Uh, so Dave's already introduced me. So thanks for that. Um, so just a quick shout out uh, to my mentors at uh, Northside Vet Specialists. Uh, thanks for putting up to me uh, with me on a day to day basis and teaching me, which is fantastic. All right. So I'm actually going to talk to you guys about a case that presented through our surgery service. But I promise um, I'm not going to talk about the surgical aspects of the case. Uh, so, um, uh, this is a 12 year old female spade, Great Dane Cross, uh, that presented, um, to surgery with a sudden onset of a left forelimb lameness. Um, there was no abnormalities, uh, found on radiographs, uh, of the shoulder, elbow and the neck, uh, and it hadn't responded to medical management. Uh, so a bit of peripheral history. Um, this dog had previously had a workup, a urinary workup, uh, and was diagnosed with um, USMI, which was being managed well. Um, it also had a history of uh, skin allergies, although uh, there wasn't too much in the history about that. It just had, had a few flare-ups. I just thought I'd mention that and you'll see why later. Um, and it had also been previously diagnosed with a right adrenal uh, mass and had a consistent hypokalemia. Um, the owners didn't, uh, well, elected not to have uh, that mass worked up further. Uh, the hypokalemia was presumed to be a hyperaldosteronism. Um, um, all right, so this is the last I'll talk about the surgery side of things, I promised. Uh, so uh, on examination with our surgery department, it's a general TPR was within normal limits, um, but it had a two out of five left forelimb lameness and two out of five um, muscle atrophy and a mild carpal effusion. Um, so the plan for this dog was to uh, go to CT scan um, of that left forelimb. Um, with then a plan uh, to do further CT scans of the abdomen and thorax uh, if there was no evidence of neoplasia in the forelimb. Uh, also, while under the general anaesthetic, uh, there was a plan to do a joint tap uh, to investigate the carpal effusion. Um, and it had some pre-general uh, anaesthetic blood work, um, which we found a hypokalemia, which was to be expected. So I've just thrown in a pretty picture here of um, the uh, CT scan, just sort of to put something there. So you can see the nice adrenal mass here. Um, and in fact, there was also um, a mass on the left side as well. All right, so our routine sort of anaesthetic protocol was to use uh, methadone and metatomidine, and um, we achieved good sedation with this protocol. Uh, we used alfaxalone to effect for the induction, uh, which is pretty standard um, for us. Um, and the dog was placed on a maintenance uh, isoflurane um, and had IV fluids uh, at a rate of five mils per kilo. Um, so the report was that throughout the whole anaesthetic, uh, the vitals were within normal limit. Although towards the end, there was difficulties um, as, uh, with measuring the blood pressure. So multiple uh, changes of cuff location and uh, yeah, just generally couldn't get a, a good blood pressure, good reliable blood pressure reading. Uh, the dog had uh, Omnipake uh, as the, um, uh, contrast agent of choice, um, and it was 2.5 mils per kilo given IV. So uh, this is where things sort of get interesting, and this is the um, part of the, not the surgery is not interesting, uh, but this is the part of the case that I'm focusing on. So um, initially in recovery, uh, the dog was sitting up and was quiet, alert, and responsive, and for all intensive purposes was, was doing quite well. Uh, however, about 20 minutes into recovery, um, the dog uh, went into lateral recumbency, uh, had cold extremities on uh, physical examination, was hypothermic, uh, had tachycardia, um, 
and was uh, extremely hypotensive. There was also frank blood on rectal examination um, and there was an elevated lactate of 3.2 uh, and elevated uh, coax. So for the emergency treatment for this dog, uh, we uh, gave it two fluid boluses uh, and the blood pressure actually recovered after these two, which was great news, uh, but it was then continued on uh, fluid therapy with half strength saline, uh, glucose and potassium. Uh, and then we had constant sort of monitoring uh, and active warming while we were trying to figure out exactly what was going on in this dog. So I guess um, this is where so Anna told me to make this as interactive as possible. So um, I've got a list written down in front of me of like our differentials and our thoughts at the time. But I guess if anyone wants to jump in and throw in some thoughts as to what they would be thinking right now, um, that could be really cool. So I'll just be quiet for one moment and see if anyone's got any ideas. <clears throat> Alpha 2 agonists reduce cardiac output considerably. They also shut down peripheral circulation. So what, what component do you think uh, in the, it, it, I, that's the definition of shock. What component yep. do you think we have here due to that, the Alpha 2 agonist? So what, um, so in the sense that, so are you referring to the metatomidine specifically? Um, so the alpha two in, as the pre-medication. Yes. Um, yeah. So the hypertension. Yeah. So um, I wasn't. Can you repeat that again? Sorry, just because uh, if you go if you go again, I didn't quite. Yeah. Quite well, get they're known it. they're known to reduce cardiac output considerably. Yeah. 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 Uh, they're also known to shut down peripheral circulation considerably. Hmm. Yeah. And that's the definition of shock to a degree. So, yeah. Um, I, whereas I doubt, as probably everyone else, that that's the only component responsible for mm. shock. Um, but would it, yeah. would it play a part? Yeah, I guess it could. And um, with that in mind, we did reverse the metatomidine. It was one of the first things um, that we did. Um, however, I guess, I, don't, I mean, I'm not an anaesthetist and certainly don't have a huge amount of experience, but... I guess my thoughts are um, that I was always taught that while um, there is peripheral vasoconstriction, um, often the blood supply to those vital organs um, and the gastrointestinal tract and everything is actually quite well preserved in, in, um, when giving uh, alpha-2 agonists. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, it's definitely on the list. It was one of the differentials, but um, and it, it still could be. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not 100% sure, I guess. Yeah. I might jump in there just as far as kind mm. of how things unfolded. Um, this, this dog didn't have cold extremities and had measurable, measurably normal blood pressure throughout the anaesthetic. Mm. Um, mm. And this was a very sort of, I mean, this dog woke up from its anaesthetic, was extubated, stood up, walked into its cage, and then within kind of five minutes of, of being in the cage collapsed. So as far as a kind of pre-medication reaction or side effect, I would have expected that to have been present throughout the anesthesia and, mm -hmm. and this tank seemed to be quite an acute onset, um, something that kind of eventuated sort of within 10 minutes of, of recovery. Yeah. Um, Could, it have bled Could it have had catecholamine release? Yeah, that was one of the other differentials, especially with the, um, you know, the knowledge of the, uh, you know, the tumours. Um, the other thought was potentially some sort of thromboembolism, um, which has led to, you know, a clot being thrown and then some sort of loss of, uh, you know, one segment of bowel. And that's why there was the front frank blood. Um, the other thought was, which came later, and the reason that it came later, and I'll show you this really cool uh, image here, uh, was some sort of anaphylactic um, reaction. And that's because um, if you see here, so this is the CT of the uh, dog's abdomen. Um, and through all, all these lumens, you've got contrast, which is leaked into the, uh, into the lumen of the GIT. So I've got another photo here, which is accumulation um, of contrast in the small intestine. And this one was labelled by a radiologist, so it's a, um, I know it's definitely uh, what we're seeing. Um, so I guess uh, I had a look in the literature um, to see if there was anything like this. And I could only really find, you know, one or two um, 
reports uh, in uh, the human literature um, talking about this sort of, uh, they describe it as angioedema uh, and accumulation of contrast. And they associated it with an allergic-like reaction um, in response to contrast. So I guess uh, my question is, has anyone seen anything like this at all? In, in Nope, okay. Um, yeah, so it was really interesting. And I guess the mechanism behind this, um, the thoughts were that, uh, you know, uh, with the release of all those inflammatory uh, mediators and you have then the leaky vasculature, um, then perhaps it's, um, uh, the contrast has leaked out into the lumen, lumen that way. Um, the other thing that I found in the literature that was quite interesting, but specific to humans is uh, they use uh, IV contrast and CTs uh, to diagnose acute abdominal bleeds, so hemorrhaging. Um, so that was, I guess, another possibility. Uh, and then the other thing I found was there was a few other diseases such as Crohn's disease, which can cause this, but I'm not really familiar with that being um, you know, pathology seen in, in, uh, in dogs and cats. So. Sorry, Paul, what was that disease? Uh, Crohn's disease in, in, in people. Yeah, yeah Crohn's. Um, so, uh, so I guess I'll just take, after, you know, seeing all, all that and then having a read in the literature about, you know, sort of contrast reactions, um, we sort of decided that that's likely what happened in this case. Um, and so I've done a bit of background reading into the topic. And so I thought I'd just, you know, share with you guys sort of some of the things I've found. Um, and then it'd be really cool if uh, other people have had similar experiences, if they could sort of pitch in and, uh, you know, share um, what they found. But basically, um, there's two divisions uh, that the American uh, College of Radiologists speak about with contrast reactions. Um, and one of these is an allergic-like reaction. Uh, and the other one is a physiologic uh, reaction. Now, the pathogenesis of both of these uh, is really poorly understood, um, and both of them are sporadic and really uh, unpredictable. Um, and because they're allergic-like reactions, uh, prior sensitization to the contrast is not actually a requirement. Um, so it's, you know, eight o'clock on a Tuesday night and immunology is challenging enough at the best of times. So I'll just whiz through this, but this is just, you know, your classic IgE mediated uh, type one hypersensitivity that I've drawn up here. And I've just, you know, put this in here to sort of remind everyone of the process. Um, and then the allergic like reaction, I've done a little analogy here, and this is sort of, you have a stimulus and this stimulus is significant enough to cause a, I guess, an irritation and, there's just a reaction um, and uh, an immune cascade that occurs as a result of that um, without actually requiring any prior um, sensitization. And so the uh, mechanisms that I read about was, you know, a complement type mechanism, um, the kinin cascade as well, uh, and then, you know, mast cell degranulation and histamine release. Uh, so on the other end of the spectrum, we have our physiologic reactions. Uh, and these, uh, are, again, are really poorly understood in the context of contrast reactions, uh, but are thought to be related uh, to specific attributes of the, uh, you know, the molecular, um, at, the, at a molecular level of the, the contrast agents themselves. And um, they're thought to be related to, you know, chemotoxicity, osmotoxicity, um, and then molecules actually binding to certain activators, which then uh, start this inflammatory sort of uh, cascade, which to be honest, you know, I read about it and it was a bit above my sort of level, um, but it was quite interesting. Um, and I guess the biggest thing that I took out of this is these physiologic reactions uh, are, they can be dose and concentration dependent, whereas um, the allergic -like, like reactions are thought to not be, uh, dose and concentration dependent. Um, furthermore, these physiologic reactions are actually really common. Um, and so I'll go into that in a bit. But even in the veterinary literature, uh, studies have found that up to sort of 20% of dogs can have a mild reaction to a, um, a contrast agent like iohexol, and 20% um, uh, can have what's classified as a moderate reaction and th there's different classification schemes but basically to go into it briefly a, a mild reaction is 
you know, some sort of a change uh, in one of the parameters that we um, measure routinely in the blood pressure, um, respiratory rate or heart rate. Uh, and a, a moderate reaction is a reaction that might require some sort of intervention. And then severe reactions, um, there's been a number reported in the literature um, and the, the way that these have sort of played out in terms of contrast reactions in general um, varies you know, quite significantly. So some animals uh, will have sort of a respiratory um, episode, they'll have severe bronchospasms uh, and require ventilation. Um, other animals uh, I found had a similar sort of incident to what we experienced. Um, which was, you know, hemorrhagic gastroenteritis um, uh, and, you know, severe hypotension. Okay, so just a bit of a brief sort of background on contrast agents themselves um, and why this is important. So, uh, and it gets a bit confusing, I guess, because there's iodinated contrast agents, which are then further divided into ionic versus non-ionic. Uh, and the important thing here, I guess, is that Non-ionic uh, refers to a low osmolality, while the ionic agents uh, are a high osmolality. And uh, historically in the human literature, and I, we have as well, as we've shifted away uh, from these uh, high osmolality uh, agents towards using these low osmolality ones. And the reason is, is because the high osmolality ones were causing a lot more uh, physiological reactions. Um, so to give you a bit of an uh, idea, so Omnipate, which is the IOHEXOL, um, the one that we frequently use for CTs, and uh, at the end, I guess I would like to hear what everyone else uses, but I, I'm presuming it's something similar, um, is a low osmolality iodinated agent. Um, so I guess uh, after this, I sort of had the question in my mind is, if this was a contrast reaction, why did it happen? Um, and unfortunately, there's just not enough literature out there in the veterinary side of things, uh, you know, uh, discussing predisposing factors of contrast reactions. There's not really much out there in terms of contrast reactions themselves. Uh, but there is a lot in the human literature. And it's interesting because um, there's a number of predisposing factors that have been suggested and previous reactions is the top one, but then things like asthma and ATP uh, are on there as well. And this dog actually, you know, had a history of ATP. Um, and there was a case series that was produced in the vet to veterinary literature and two out of three of the dogs that had a contrast reaction um, also had a history of ATP. So I found that quite interesting. Um, there was one study in the veterinary literature that looked at age, weight and sex. Uh, and they found that there was no uh, effect on the likelihood of a reaction in dogs and cats. Uh, finally, uh, the speed and the volume of the bolus. Um, the speed has been debated in the human literature, but the consensus now is that there's no um, association with a high, high speed um, delivery and a reaction. And the volume has thought to be potentially important in physiologic reactions, but uh, deemed to be not important in allergic like reactions. Um, so a bit of trivia, this is more for like other interns and residents out there who frequently monitor anesthetics for CTs. So what does everyone think can happen when, um, what effect can IV contrast have on blood pressure, A, B, or C? If anyone doesn't want to turn their mic on, they can put their vote through the chat. Um, <laughs> I'll come down the bottom of the screen. But we'll, we'll whiz through it anyway, because um, I guess um, the next is the effect on heart rate. Um, so A, B, or C. And finally, um, respiratory rate, so A, B, or C. Cool. I don't know how to open the chat, so I'm sorry. I can't see what everyone's saying, everyone's uh, but saying, here's the answer. Everyone's saying C to everything. Great. Yeah, cool. And um, this was really interesting because the radiologist at work was actually saying to me that the anaesthetist um, that he's worked with usually can tell as soon as he's given the contrast, which I think is something really cool. Um, and it's prompted me to think more about it. And I guess the point I want to make here is that in this study, um, that I've, I can, I'm happy to send out to everyone, uh, Scarabelli et al. They found that actually 20% of these changes, anaesthetists um, deemed them to be significant enough to warrant some sort of intervention. Um, so I think it's just something really important to keep um, in the back of our mind. All right, so I guess um, I'll open it up to everyone. Um, has anyone experienced 
uh, or a suspected um, or a confirmed, I guess it's a difficult thing to confirm, contrast reaction? Um, or does anyone have any sort of alternate explanations that could, you know, uh, inform you as to, you know, a different idea of what went on in this case? I'm going to put my hand up and say, Paul, that's an awesome presentation one. Oh, oh thanks. <laughs> I've not seen that. And I was just talking to Richard, my husband, who's a radiologist, and he has not seen it. And, uh, um, and, the doc, uh, and at the RBC, obviously, they were monitoring things closely as well. So I was just wondering with that study that you were talking about, what, like, obviously, anaesthetists get a bit excited, but what were the yeah. things the anaesthetists were worried about, in particular with the moderate reactions? Yeah, so they, in fact, they don't go into it so much in the paper. Um, they just say interventions, but I'm presuming it's things like hypotension, um, which they would have acted on. Uh, but it's a really good question. I, I am happy to send the paper out, but there's nothing really specific in there in terms of, um, you know, how they, how they responded. Um, in the American College of Radiologists uh, handbook on reactions, they've got a really good classification scheme in there. And basically they divide contrast reactions into, um, you know, mild, moderate and severe. Uh, and it's sort of mild in humans as if, you know, people develop a bit of an itch or they feel a bit funny. Um, and they always, I guess the important thing is, is even if it's mild, they always deem it as an, as an important thing to follow up and, uh, monitor, uh, whereas moderate is something, you know, uh, a decrease in blood pressure that could potentially even lead to um, a, I guess, a loss of consciousness or something like that. Um, and then severe is um, a, uh, you know, a, a severe contrast. So uh, reactions are like an anaphylaxis, I guess. Oh, sorry. I guess the big, um, the big uh, difference is, in human in the human world is I suppose they're not um, dealing with anaesthetized patients um, so it makes it somewhat I found it difficult to sort of bring that information across you know to our context where everything's under an anaesthetic. The other thing that I find hard to interpret with these reactions is that we're, we're giving such a huge volume of fluid in these patients um, you know over a really short time frame obviously that's going to have impacts on the heart rate and blood pressure giving such a kind of high volume bolus. So a lot of these reactions that were kind of reported look like such a high incidence of reactions, but I was wondering how much of that is kind of hemodynamic rather than a true, it's obviously not all immunologic reactions. Um, and my, certainly my experience and anecdotally talking to people since this case, true, like sort of scary reactions, severe reactions, pretty rare, but yeah. it's heart rate changes or blood pressure changes are really common. Mm. Yeah, and I guess the, you know, everything, even in the human literature, even when they have these predisposing factors that they know are predisposing factors in people, there are very few that they actually do anything about. So they'll rarely pre-medicate um, with, uh, you know, things like cortisone. Um, and the, their justification is that, it, you know, the rate of a severe reaction is so, so small. And it seems to be the same trend in, in the veterinary world, which is... Um, you know, a good thing. <laughs> All right. Hi, Paul. Yes. Yeah. Awesome presentation. Oh, um, hi, Liz. <laughs> hey. <laughs> good to see one of our old students now teaching. Yeah. You. Oh. Um, I had two questions. One is, it was really cool to see the contrast on the in the lumen of the gut like that. I haven't mm. seen that before, and I wanted to. I was curious if you saw any gallbladder wall edema or. Mm. contrast inside the gallbladder or anything like that because we mm. could see some anaphylaxis yeah that's really good good point um i don't know off the the top of my head i'll have to go back and have a look um i'll have to go back and yeah i might have a chat to the radiologist tomorrow and we'll go back and have a look um and I, and then if there is I'll, I'll i'll send it i'll send something out i'll get out and send something out um but off the top of my head i i don't think so and then the only other um, question I had is how the, how's the dog now? Because I guess it's had Ooh. some risk factors for AKI if it's had hypotension under anesthesia and contrast at the same time and then in some sort of anaphylactic-like reaction. Are its kidneys okay? 
Yeah, so it's a really good point. Um, and look, it recovered um, and was discharged. So it sort of recovered uh, quite significantly in terms of its demeanour and everything that evening um, and was walking and everything uh, after a very stressful, you know, three or four hours um, and then remained in hospital with us for another three days and was discharged. And we were monitoring the kidney values um, and the, uh, you know, the values were all okay. Uh, I actually nearly fell over today when I walked in and I saw it, the doctor dog's name uh, on the patient list. So I panicked, um, but it was coming in for a routine uh, Depomedrol injection. So I was really relieved to say that. And that to me suggests that, you know, everything's going really well. So yeah, but it, yeah. Can I just ask a question? Yeah, um, yeah. Just, um, I'm still interested in adrenal disease and I'm interested in whether it really did have hyperaldosteronism or not. And it seems to me that if I was worried about a problem under general anaesthesia, an animal that may or may not have had an aldosterone producing tumour, I would like to know that before I knocked it out. And if it did, then I'd want to give it spironolactone to make it a better surgical candidate and it isn't just you know the hyperkalemia it, it, it is a good cause of hypertension mm. so I, I just and, and I'm confused about its orthopedic problem and I've got no idea what its depomedrol injections about but you know it looks like it has really interesting adrenal disease and I'm just interested what you guys are doing about that yeah, Richard, I'd looked after this dog extensively around Christmas time and the owners, I'd had to cancel their ski trip to America in January because, you know, the dog was at imminent risk of death. So uh, they sort of, um, they refused CT and investigation for surgery. And <clears throat> sorry, Paul, I never kind of reviewed what kind of endocrine workup at, I did at the time with regard to looking for a fee or anything. You know, cons is super rare in a dog, so you know, I can't even remember reading a case report on it, so we didn't really consider that, so I'm not sure whether that... You know, the, the dog actually developed some Cushing's-like signs and was a bit PPD, and um, so I wonder if it was just losing calcium in its urine and it was a bit hypertensive from hyper-A, uh, you know, rather than hyper-aldosteronism, hyper but... The dog sort of slipped through the medical net a little bit and went into surgery to investigate some orthopedic problems. And you know, I guess the owners had sort of had become convinced that the dog was invincible and um, was never going to die of its adrenal disease and so pursued its um, orthopedic problems. You know, I think the Depomedrone was in a, an elbow, was it, today? Um, yeah, I think it was an, el an elbow. Yeah, yeah. It was. Yeah, but I was present when the dog had this um, possible anaphylactic reaction and you know, started spewing lava out of its bottom and having a hypertensive crisis. And I immediately thought it had thrombosed its gut or something like that, which um, thankfully it doesn't seem to have. But um, yeah, so I guess in, in short, Richard, the kind of endocrine workup had been curtailed because they were just sort of palliative care and take it each day as it comes and yet the dog is still thriving eight months later and worried about its DJD more than anything. Can I ask a question and I'm not, um, what effects does metatomidine have on re, on potassium? Like, does it go intracellularly, extracellularly? I don't actually know the answer. Ooh. Yeah, I, I'm not, I'd, I'd be making it up if I tried to answer that. So, I, yeah, I might have to yeah. defer that to. I can't answer that either, actually. <laughs> that <laughs> makes me feel a lot better. <laughs> me three, I can't answer that. I was wondering if the Malik Meister might have an answer to that because he used to be an anesthesia PhD student or something, weren't you, Bridget? So he disappeared again. Well, I think Martin Pearson. Man knows when not to say anything. Martin Pearson wouldn't let us touch Delmator in the days I was at uni with Richard, so um, I reckon Richard wasn't using it much in those in those days. But like, I guess um, metatomidine is very very similar to ACP, which I'm sure. Um, no, 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 no. Okay, good. No, 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 no. 
Metatomidine is, is, is an alpha-2 adrenoreceptor agonist. So they're all variations on the parent drug, which is clonidine. Okay, so that, they've got myriad effects everywhere. They produce hyperglycemia and osmotic diuresis and a whole lot of different things. So, so their are, uh, effects are very complicated and they're also very dose dependent. I thought you were going somewhere with that and doing a Dr. Carl for us. No, 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 but all I mean, like, like ACE promazine is an, an alpha one blocker. It's a very, in fact, it blocks almost every, every type of receptor. It's just a very different pharmacology between the phenothiazine derivative tranquilizer and an alpha two adrenoreceptor agonist. I mean, I think this is extrapolating and I don't really know if this is connected, but the mechanism of hypokalemia with FAOs is that the beta agonism causes the potassium to move intracellularly. So I don't know if there could potentially be a similar mechanism. But I think Richard's point about kind of focusing on the adrenal gland, adrenal gland mass is important because I think that's where we focused when this dog wasn't doing well in recovery and our leading differentials were like, has it had a like adrenaline, adrenaline release from a potential FAO or thrown a clot? And I think we kind of thought, you know, did it have a reaction at the time of the contrast being administered? No. Okay, let's cross that kind of off the list. Let's now focus on how the adrenal gland has caused these clinical signs. And probably when thinking about the way that we think we might have gone a bit tunnel visioned with that, which probably in the context was reasonable, but now having, you know, we've done like a round table discussion on this case and reviewed it, probably it's a good lesson of taking a step back and, you know, thinking about all the possibilities of it. All right, well, thanks. I think you all wrapped up there, Paul. Paul, that was awesome. Yeah. Well done, mate. Oh, thanks. We really thanks, appreciate guys. that. So a grand finale, just so we can get to bed at some time. Uh, Dr. Anna Denka, take it away. Um, yeah, well done, Paul. That was, can I just say, Paul's been out of uni for six months now. <laughs> Doing really well. <laughs> um, all right, so I'm going to try and share my screen now. Should be interesting. All right. Okay, can everyone see it? Yeah. Yeah, okay, super. Um, okay, so I'm gonna talk about Jake, who is a six month old, a six year old, beg your pardon, male neutered rag doll, um, who presented to us a couple of months ago. Um, and I have to say that this case is still a work in progress and I, I'm actually presenting it because I'd really like some input. So if at any point anybody wants to ask any questions to clarify things along the way, um, ask as we go, just jump in and interrupt. I don't mind at all. Um, so Jake presented to us with a long history of vomiting. So he's, he's a cat that vomits around about once a month on a regular basis, um, sometimes increases to about a weekly frequency particularly when he's kind of grooming a lot. He's a long-haired cat, um, often brings up hairballs and the vomiting doesn't seem to have any association with um, food intake. Um, so often on an empty stomach, often brings up hairballs, not consistently kind of straight after meals or anything. Um, over the five days prior to presenting to us, he'd been vomiting daily at least, sometimes a couple of times a day. Um, and in his last vomit, he'd produced just a really small hairball, not a kind of big, solid thing but just a clump of hair um, and literally the owner's description of what happened is so uh, a proper vomit um, where with abdominal contractions and then a terminal retch which produced this kind of bilious fluid and this small hairball and the owner reported that immediately after that vomit he stumbled over to his bed with his neck extended open mouth breathing and just really gasping for air immediately after vomiting um, and he sort of said completely normal up to the vomit and then completely abnormal immediately afterwards. And what I found really interesting about his history was that the owner said exactly the same thing happened two years ago. Um, and he was diagnosed with aspiration pneumonia at the time. 
um, and it resolved with a two week course of PLAB. Um, and he had chest radiographs and things at the time and we were unable to actually get the history of his previous visit. Um, but the owner was really um, sure of the diagnosis and the course of treatment and things. Um, so Jake presented to us in acute respiratory distress. Um, he had a series of thoracic radiographs performed. Um, and I think we can probably all agree that... Sorry, was that a question? No? Um, so I think we can all agree um, that there's an increased, probably increased radio density in the um, corded also lung fields up here. Um, both laterals were fairly similar in appearance. There wasn't one that was, was particularly worse than the other. Um, but there were certainly some patchy sort of um, interstitial inf infiltrates in particularly the caudal lung fields. Um, and similar in the VD, nothing kind of particularly localizable. Um, so I'm just going to keep a kind of running problem list here. Um, so first we've got vomiting. We've got acute onset dyspnea associated with that vomit. And I've put on here pulmonary hypertension, and that's a pretty big assumption based on these radiographs. Um, but going back to that lateral, um, if you can see my cursor here, we sort of talk about veins being the ventral and central um, in radiographs. So I've got a pulmonary vein here running alongside that, that main stem bronchus. And I've got a pulmonary artery here, and as it crosses that four through, but certainly wider in diameter than the vein is. And that's a pretty soft finding, and certainly wouldn't hang my hat on anything in a cat. Um, but it's also pretty unusual to see um, arterial dilation in a cat. Um, so I've put a very sort of presumptive pulmonary hypertension on there, and I've put interstitial lung pattern on there as our kind of working problem list. Um, Jake, Jake's respiratory effort settled just with kind of hospitalization. He was placed in an oxygen cage when he initially presented for a few hours. We were unable to reliably get an SpO2 on him conscious and it was contraindicated to keep him sedated um, given that he, he seemed to be compensating on his own. Um, so he didn't require any specific intervention. He had some butorphanol um, at initial presentation. He was started on piperacillin tazobactam um, in case it was a repeat episode of aspiration ammonia and transferred through to us in the morning. He had some haematology performed, um, which was fairly normal. As you can see, everything's kind of between the flags, apart from a very subtle thrombocytopenia, which was um, supported by a smear, but that's a pretty subtle thrombocytopenia for me to pick up um, in a smear. But I thought there were that I, I counted around about 100 platelets. So um, that seemed to be pretty accurate and there were no clumps on my smear. And biochemistry, and as you can see, um, there's not, not anything really jumping out as abnormal here, and particularly things that I'd be interested in a cat with chronic vomiting. His globulin levels are kind of mid-range to high normal. Um, he doesn't look like he's got a significant amount of, of systemic inflammation, and I should go back to the haematology, actually, as far as looking for systemic inflammation in a cat with a query of aspiration pneumonia. I don't think that neutrophil count is very impressive, but obviously we need to take repeated samples to um, establish a trend in that. Um, he had a venous blood gas performed on the blood that was collected for his biochemical profile. Um, and he had a sort of borderline low bicarb, a norm, mid range normal pH, um, and he was hypercapnic. Um, on the venous sample, but it's pretty borderline. The electrolytes were all normal. Um, because he had this chronic history of vomiting and particularly this sort of acute on chronic increase in frequency of vomiting, he did have an abdominal ultrasound performed. Unfortunately, it was on a day where there was no radiologist um, in the clinic. There was only one day a week <laughs> there was no radiologist in the clinic, but I did this ultrasound. And at the time, I thought his pancreas didn't look particularly hypoechoic, but it was prominent. And the tissue surrounding the pancreas, the fat sort of surrounding it, particularly cranially and surrounding the portal vein, which is shown on this image here, is just a little bit bright relative to the other fat in the area. Um, and his gallbladder wall just looked really marginally thickened, um, but not necessarily kind of 
it's potentially got a tiny little tiger stripe there. So I wouldn't necessarily describe it as edematous. I'd just describe it as subtly thickened. And then we've got that bright sort of fat around the, the periportal um, region. So Jake, we, I actually, I didn't put it in here, but I did do an echo on him, which was normal. So the right side of his heart looked quite normal. Um, echocardiographically, but I, I do actually find cats very hard to image the right side of their heart um, accurately. And I usually get Rita to do it, but again, she wasn't in that day. That's um, pretty, pretty disappointing given the pulmonary artery on the radiograph, isn't it? I know, absolutely, yeah. Um, but I, I actually looked specifically for a tricuspid regurg, couldn't find one, and the right ventricular wall looked normal. There was no sort of significant flattening of the septum, to my knowledge. Um, so I couldn't find any evidence of pulmonary hypertension on the right-hand side of the heart in this cat. Um, so this is a, actually a video of, sorry, was that a question? Oh. Um, so given that um, Jake is a rag doll, he actually did have a pro BNP performed as well as the um, echo, which was normal, um, sort of low end normal as well. Um, so went ahead with a CT scan of his thorax, and this is a video of it, and it does sort of go a little bit slowly, so I might jump ahead. So this is a post-contrast soft tissue um, image of his um, thorax. Now, as we go through, I'll pause it when we get to the sort of interesting part. Oops, it is, sorry. <laughs> um, so what I want to show you is in this pulmonary artery here, so the right main pulmonary artery. So we come, if you follow, follow that, we come down into the pulmonary outflow tract here, branching off into left and right main stem pulmonary arteries. And in the lumen of this pulmonary artery, have a look at this PTE, the clot that's stuck in that vessel. It's absolutely huge. So that clot is essentially almost completely occluding blood flow to the right lung. And then you can't see it as well in the soft tissue reconstruction that optimizes for, see that clot, it's amazing. Um, but optimizes for visualizing that clot. But actually in the left lung, there's a series of sort of wedge-shaped lesions at the periphery, which are consistent with um, further um, thromboembolic events in the left lung also. Um, so there's a huge loss of, of lung volume, or a big pattern of, of um, blood flow to both the right lung and also segments of the left lung. Um, so these cats, had a huge thromboembolic event going to its um, pulmonary vasculature. And we ha had a lot of trouble kind of tying that in with, you know, why has this happened immediately after vomiting? Again, checked the right atrium, had that the right side of the heart reviewed on the CT scan, and there was no evidence of right side of cardiomegaly. Um, we, apart from that sort of clot in the pulmonary artery, um, we couldn't see any evidence of heartworm or anything, but we did run heartworm antibody and antigen titers just to, to be sure. Um, as we sort of scroll through the CT scan to get to the abdomen, fortunately our very clever radiologist Mariano has noticed, oh, see, this is gonna stretch my CT knowledge. Have a look at this vessel here. So phrenic vein, I think. And then a vessel diving off the side of that and joining onto the gastric vein. So this cat has a gast gastro left gastrophrenic portosystemic shunt. Despite having no biochemical or clinical symptoms of a shunt, um, historically or presently. 
So our problem list we have now, got this shunt. I'm going to say we've got a problem list of vomiting. We can explain our dyspnea, pulmonary hypertension and interstitial lung patterns with the PTE. We can explain our thrombocytopenia with the PTE also. I would say that's consumptive thrombocytopenia. Um, we did an arterial blood gas while this cat was under anaesthetic. And interestingly, she'd been hypercapnic on venous blood sample. Uh, and he, he was remained hypercapnic on the arterial blood sample, um, which is actually unusual in uh, a patient with PTE. And I don't have an explanation for that. So if anybody can contribute to that, I'd, I'd very much welcome it. Um, she was a little bit hypokalemic at, at this point, having been hospitalised and on fluids for 24 hours. So I suspect that's iatrogenic hypokalemia. Um, the periportal hyperepigenicity I have um, attributed to right-sided congestion. So a little bit of um, edema surrounding the um, caudal cava and increased fluid in that area. So we have a PTE, a portosystemic shunt and vomiting still to kind of explain. So additional testing that we did um, heartworm antigen and antibody was negative, as we talked about. We did run a toxoplasmosis, IgG and IgM um, titer, and both of them were less than 1 in 16. So it's probable that this cat hasn't actually been exposed to toxoplasmosis. Um, and we did run a coagulation profile, um, more to screen for um, kind of factor deficiencies, such as factor 12 deficiency, which actually can cause um, hypercoagulability in cats. Um, but in cats with factor 12 deficiency, often purebred cats, quite common in purebred cats, they have quite a profoundly elevated APTT. Um, and Jake had a, a mildly elevated APTT, which we see quite commonly, unfortunately, with the in-house coag um, profile. Um, and this wasn't profound enough. I, I think this is probably due to consumptive coagulopathy associated with PTE rather than um, a, a, a factor 12 deficiency. So the sort of um, treatment for Jake, as I said, he wasn't actually oxygen dependent. Um, he ha was given meropotent for his vomiting and, and nausea. Um, we started him on a combination of anticoagulants, um, rivaroxaban at 2.5 milligrams per oz SID and clopidogrel, 18.75 milligrams SID. Um, and we also started him on Ventolin and we used two puffs of the cellbutamol puffer, BID also. He actually improved really well. He went home two days after presentation with what we could what measure as normal oxygen levels. So SpO2 was normal and oxygen, oxygenating well. And I, I should, should have pointed out, but um, on 100% oxygen on his blood, arterial blood gas, his PaO2 was 440. Um, so he actually had quite good um, ability to oxygenate based on that. Um, so only marginally um, compromised in that regard. So he actually improved quite well with this therapy. So what the questions that I have in this case, um, I wanted to just work through with everybody if everybody's willing to get involved in the conversation. And again, if you'd rather use the chat um, to contribute, um, feel free to put some sort of comments in there. Um, firstly, typically on either CT or radiographs, we see kind of atelectasis developing in, in cases of PTE. Um, in this case, the left lung was com almost completely clotted and we had very little collapse of that lung whereas on the contralateral side in the smaller um, areas, we had some atelectasis in the um, areas, the sort of wedge-shaped areas at the periphery of the lung field where there'd been thromboembolic events also. So it sort of led us to look into why does the lung collapse with PTE? Um, and has anybody dealt with this before, particularly in cats? No one? Um, so 
Decreased blood flow through the lung will decrease surfactant production in the lung, which, you know, the surfactant keeps those alveoli open. And without that surfactant, the alveoli collapse. So we've got a really good explanation for why the lung collapses. What I don't have a good explanation for is why when such a profound obstruction of blood flow occurred in the left lung, right lung, sorry, I've forgotten now, in, in one of the lungs, <laughs> um, why that didn't collapse. And I think it's probably that we could sort of see that clot within the pulmonary artery and we could also see contrast enhancement around it. So I think there must have been some residual blood flow to that, that whole lung to maintain, enough to maintain production of, of surfactant in that lung. Um, and that's consistent with this cat's oxygenation or um, levels, that, that that lung has to be more functional than it looked on the CT scan. Is there any kind of debate around that that anybody wants to talk, talk about? Good. Um, okay, second question is um, why we use Bentolin in this cat? Um, particularly given on CT, there was no report of bronchial thickening or, or any kind of obvious bronchitis. Um, and the answer was when we were doing our research on what happens in the lung with PTE and why it collapses, um, one of the things we came across was that the platelets aggregating or an, uh, activating in that, so sort of platelet comes across a clot and it's activated by the other activated platelets and it releases histamine. And so there's several reports in the literature, not, not in cats so much, but in humans, of um, presentations of asthma being due to PTE. So the release of histamines from platelets activating locally will cause local bronchoconstriction um, and local asthma, even in, in patients that don't have underlying asthma. Has anybody seen before or is that, was that on anybody's radar? It was a bit of a light bulb for me, so I thought I'd share it. And this one, I genuinely, I actually searched the literature. Um, why was he persistently hypercapnic? My initial thought was he didn't have, so, you know, ventilation perfusion mismatch. He didn't have the capacity to um, breathe out his CO2. And that really fit with our end tidal CO2 was 22 at the time that our um, PA CO2 was 44 or something. Um, so the end tidal was much lower. And I thought, oh yes, he's not able to breathe out his CO2, but then he's getting plenty of oxygen. So there, there's definitely gas exchange occurring. So I think this is potentially um, an artifact or, or I, I actually can't explain it any other way. Anybody have any other input? Crickets tonight. Are there any? Whoops. I'm not sure I can see if there's any chat coming through. Can anybody else see that? I can see the chat. I'm not sure I have any answers to any of your questions. I'm sorry, Anna. <laughs> Come on, Ames. <laughs> I'm counting it. But I'm still wondering where your urine analysis is. Oh, it was done. Sorry. <laughs> Excellent. Good. So it wasn't proteinuric. It was not proteinuric. No, sorry. I can, I can take my questions about where the hypercoagulability came from. Uh, sorry. Yeah. So yes, we'll get, we'll definitely get to that. Okay. Um, so if no one can explain the hypercapnia to me, um, we'll move on to where did the PTE clock come from? And now in humans, so I've done a fair bit of work with human hematology labs and a fair bit of research work on hypercoagulability in dogs and cats. And it's definitely a, an interest area for me. Um, and certainly in humans, when there's a PTE, the clot has come from the legs, essentially. So it usually comes from the, the big veins in the legs and it gets dislodged by something in circulation. And the next narrowest vessel it hits is the microvasculature and the lungs or like sort of the next smallest part of the vessels in the lungs um, having gone through the right side of the heart and in our patients we don't tend to 
diagnose PTE very often. And I don't think we have that kind of ordered way of thinking about it. And, you know, that kind of reactive, okay, we've seen a PTE, where did the clock come from kind of thing? But certainly my experience told me I needed to be looking for where this clock came from. It didn't develop locally in the lungs, it came from somewhere. Um, which is why I was so interested when we found the shunt, because I otherwise couldn't tie this in with um, the vomiting episode. So I think the options for where this clot came from is either right side of the heart, which is less likely given both on echocardiogram and CT. There was no right, right side of cardiomegaly. There was no evidence of um, heartworm, which could have predisposed to either clot formation or actually been the thrombus, the, the embolus itself, um, a worm dislodging and, and lodging into the pulmonary artery. Um, there was no evidence of caudal cable thrombosis, dilation or hepatic venous congestion re resulting from that. Um, and we've got this shunt in a cat that's com been completely non-clinical for portosystemic shunt, both sort of biochemically, hematologically and clinically. Um, so my assumption is, and if anybody jumps in and says this is rubbish, um, I'm more than welcome to more than open to the conversation. But my assumption is, is that this is a, a low flow clot and stasis as one of our causes of thrombosis um, or clot formation um, has contributed in that shunt, has contributed to a clot forming in the shunt. And the positive pressure in the abdomen generated by vomiting has dislodged that clot within the shunt into the systemic circulation, gone into the cava, gone into through the right side of the heart and into the lungs. And that's now happened twice in this cat. Which leads me to my next question. Well, can I ask, sorry, can I ask you a question? Yes, please. And maybe this could be something that goes out to all people. Yes. Um, the frequency of gastrophrenic um, shunts in cats, I think is relatively high in comparison to dogs. And this isn't something I've ever seen before, but I'm not obviously very experienced. So I was wondering um, if anyone else has any experience with seeing something similar to this in, yeah, similar this before. Just because I, I think that these shunts are, the sub, these subclinical shunts are more common than, um, uh, yeah, they're not in, uncommon. I've certainly only found shunts in cats when I've gone looking for them. This is the first case of an incidental shunt for me. Yeah. I don't think they're particularly uncommon. Uh, we do find them incidentally. And I guess the other thing is that this particular type of shunt we see in dogs, but we don't often associate it with PTE. I'd be more inclined to believe that this particular shunt is an incidental finding unrelated to the presenting complaint, but I just don't know if I... I think it's a really interesting theory that they could have changes in blood flow and stagnancy leading to clot formation. I don't like, I wouldn't exclude it at all. I think it's, that's a really interesting thing. I just wonder if, yeah. The rate at which your voice is changing, changing by octaves is quite... I know, it's amazing, isn't it? Oh. Um, yeah, it just changed colour too. Oh, was that Richard? <laughs> <laughs> Did you really think it was me? I was trying to work out who was talking. I was scrolling through all the people who were on Zoom. Uh, <laughs> and I think, I think I have, I'd, entertain, I'd entertain the idea that they were unrelated if this was a first occurrence, but this, this has happened to this cat twice. So it's had an acute onset respiratory distress associated with vomiting. And the distribution of changes, I mean, this, this wasn't aspiration pneumonia this time. Um, and I struggled to, you know, the cat had normal laryngeal function, which I looked at in detail on induction for the CT. I, I struggle to think that a cat would have aspirated. I don't know. It just, yeah, I, I feel like this has happened twice in this cat. I feel like the chronology might be tricky knowing that cats with like, regardless of their disease often have vomiting as a feature, whether it was he threw a clot and vomited or he vomited and threw a clot. Yeah, that, uh, that was one of the questions I wondered, like what, when you have a PTE, like, do you ever feel nauseous? Do you ever vomit as a result of having a PTE? Like, is that from vagal tone or something like that? 
And in, in that case, I don't have an explanation of where this has come from. But couldn't it still be stasis from the shunt? He's thrown a clot and as part of that clot, he has vomited because cats only ever present with vomiting and appetence and lethargy. <laughs> Potentially, but then that doesn't, I, I guess that's, that doesn't change anything. No. So the, the shunt caused the clot potentially. My only other thought, it certainly sounds like it was vomiting because I think you said it brought up fur balls at the time, but mm -hmm. sometimes coughing cats look like vomiting cats, whether the owner mistook vomiting for coughing and it was coughing with a PTE, but probably not true if it's bringing up fur balls. <laughs> I quizzed him actually pretty hard on that because I reckon every asthmatic cat I've ever diagnosed, they say, oh, do they get fur balls? Like, yeah. Yeah, they're always trying to bring up fur balls. And I'm like, no, they're not. <laughs> um, so I actually quizzed him pretty hard on that. And it was bleh, vomit. It wasn't, it was certainly, no, no, I, ne I never see a cough. No, no, I know what coughing looks like. No, that's not it sort of thing. Um, but certainly I'd entertain the idea that there could be coughing. The cat never had coughing in hospital over the two days that it was with us um, as a clinical sign. So I think having an acute onset coughing without further coughing would be unusual. So that leads on, my, on to my next question. Who thinks I need to ligate the shunt? I don't need to do it. I need to refer it to a surgeon too. I'm gonna to put my hand up I'm not sure. Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna say- Can I ask, oh, sorry. You go, Liz. Oh, I was just going to ask, is there any sort of, um, is there any way you could prove that there's stasis in terms of the blood flow in that vessel? Like, are there any diagnostic tests? That it's... Oh. Like Califflow Doppler. We could do, but I'm not sure how accurate the measurements are, like whether we'd detect sort of decreased velocity in a shunt relative to the portal vasculature or? No, but what, you might see a clot in, in the shunt. You might see um, sluggish flow, agglutination of platelets. Like there might be an anatomical substrate you can see with color flow Doppler. Yeah. If, if, like, I like your theory. It makes the whole world of sense to me. And you have a choice of either you ligate the shunt to prevent it happening or you have lifetime anticoagulation in the cat. They're my choices too. And, and, and it's likely to be a nice, easy to ligate shunt because you don't have the neurological and other manifestations of the portosystemic shunt that go with a very large amount of blood going through it. So hopefully there's just a little bit. I also wondered when you went through the thing whether pancreatitis might not be part of the mix. You did show some ultrasound images with you doing it. I wondered whether local inflammation might contribute to some altered blood flow, stasis, inflammation, you know, that might have made a clot more likely to form in that spot That's a good the point. vomiting thing went boom and you've got a PTA. Absolutely. And I think that's, that's an important thing is this cat had an increase in vomiting frequency in the five days preceding this. So it, the last vomit led to the PTA, but this cat had something actively, presumably inflammatory going on in its either stomach upper or upper GIT at the time, which is one of the, again, another one of the kind of um, triad of, you know, contributing to hypercoagulability. We might have some stasis, but we might also have some hypercoagulability associated with inflammation in this situation. It's a good point. Um, and I, I agree with Richard, I think sort of having spoken to a few surgeons that the, um, the surgery sh shouldn't be too complicated and given that the cat's not clinical for it and we've got a normal sized liver with normal portal vasculature throughout it, um, the consequences to this cat of ligating the shunt should be fairly low risk, except that I've just anticoagulated it a lot. And le leads me to my next question of 
what sort of washout are you guys doing? Like presumably a lot of you have, have sent patients to surgery who are on both or, or either clopidogrel or rivaroxaban. What sort of washout are we doing for both of them before going ahead with the surgery? Um, for what I've read with rivaroxaban, it's pretty short, like two to three days. So but that was more focused on dogs when I was looking into it for a patient, but it's maybe somewhat similar in cats. And that's what my sort of um, reading has given me sort of five days before kind of um, measurable effect is kind of, there's no more measurable, measurable effect five days after the last dose. Um, so I was thinking sort of seven days for the river oxaban, but I know the clopidogrel is much more variable. Um, and I have actually lost a patient sending it to surgery from just oozing, like sort of bleeding that was not um, manageable, um, that was sort of within a week of, of finishing clopidogrel. And I thought a week, based on my research, I thought a week was a reasonable washout time. And I'm just wondering whether anybody's had that same experience. I thought you would have been on the money with a week. Like that is consistent with what the literature says as far as I'm aware too. So. Yeah. Um, and in, so we've got the option, I guess, of potentially stopping anticoagulants a week before going ahead with the surgery and then switching to Fragman or um, an injectable um, two-way inhibitor, which might be sort of reversible with protamine. Um, would anybody kind of go down that route or given that the, the, the potential for a clot forming at this point is fairly low impact on the cat, as long as we're managing the vomiting, would we just stop anticoagulants altogether? Hi, Anna, it's Lara here. Hi, Lara. I guess, I guess we don't know for sure that the shunt caused the, the clot. So I just wonder whether if the cat goes to surgery and it's anesthetised and recumbent and things, whether that would increase its clot risk intra and postoperatively. And is there another problem there that needs ongoing management and anticoagulants? I guess that's what we don't know. And I was just wondering, I haven't heard of clot specifically associated with shunt in cats or other species, I don't know. I guess I've normally had problems with bleeding with shunt mm -hmm. patients. And uh, I was just wondering whether there are reports of um, clots associated with shunt in other species like dogs or something. No, I've searched pretty far and wide and I can't find any at all, Lara, um, which is disappointing because it doesn't support my theory. <laughs> um, tricky one. Sorry? Tricky case. Tricky, yeah. And I think, uh, like, you know, the cat's coping really well with anticoagulants. I think it's quite reasonable to sort of just say we're just going to keep keep them on it for life, but it might not be necessary. And it just, yeah, yeah. There's a there's a a lot of kind of potentially, you know, I need a crystal ball to know what to do with this case. I think. Um, so next question again sort of understanding what's happening in this cat we take it off anticoagulants for a week or two weeks potentially preoperatively um i would quite like to repeat the ct preoperatively to see whether we can actually document where the clot is in presumably somewhere in the either the portal or caudal cable right atrial kind of areas um, so if a clot redevelops in that time frame um, we'll, we'll potentially be able to see it on ct um, and it will also be nice to document that the resolution of the PTE in the, in the pulmonary artery. Um, I don't think it increases the cost significantly and there's not really that much of a downside to doing it, but can anybody see a downside to doing a C another CT preoperatively? Only time under anaesthetic and hypothermia and all of those things, but mm. otherwise nothing specific. 
But how reassuring would it be if you go into surgery and like the lungs look beautiful and there's no clot and you'll sleep well that night. And at least what if there's a big clot still in there? Then you just go to shaking your head like you have been. <laughs> what are you going to do if there is? Are you going to cancel surgery? I don't know. Well, I don't think so. I think I'd probably base it on the arterial blood gas again. But, you know, based on the arterial blood gas last time, I would have sent this, this cat to surgery. Um, we, Fernando came in to do an anesthetic for us recently, a cat, and taught us how to do um, arterial blood gas measurement from a tail, a tail artery in the cat. It's, is everybody doing this? It's amazing. <laughs> it's so much easier <laughs> than any other artery. Anyway, I'm going to be doing lots of arterial blood gas. <laughs> um, Hang on, Richard, uh, Richard wants to say something. He's, he just wants you to know it's him, not me. Okay. Hey, guys. Interesting discussion. My only comment would be that shunts are generally a result of increased blood flow. And so in most cases where we see shunt, the, the shunting blood flow is preferential to the path of normal flow, i.e. through the portal vein. And that tends to be why they stay open. And so in the cases of shunts like this or, you know, multiple acquired shunts and so forth, we don't typically expect to see sluggish blood flow. So even these phrenico um, a gastric or whatever, um, even though they're up against the diaphragm, we don't typically expect to see slowed blood flow when compared to the normal portal vein. It should be of a similar velocity or even increased. And I guess the other corollary is that we see dogs with portoazygous shunts, and these clearly pass through the diaphragm and are affected by presumably diaphragmatic compression because often these dogs present later in life. You know, these are the five, six, seven, eight year old dogs that present with um, portosystemic signs, um, but they're slowly developing. And that's why we often see them at a later stage. We don't often associate these dogs with um, thrombolic events, um, even though we're suspicious that there is slower flow through these shunting vessels. Um, and my question is, do we look for it specifically? Like how, how big does a clot need to be in the lungs before you detect it? Both clinically and on CT. Like is, is this just massively underdiagnosed? Make sure of your question. Sorry. Because this, this is a massive PTE. But maybe the shunt's only a small part of it in that there's an underlying hepatopathy that's impacting. We can see mixtures of hyper and hypocoagulability and changes with fibrinolysis. And like there's an underlying hepatic, like a hepatopathy, and the shunt is just one part of the puzzle. And on, yep. on sorry, on Richard's sort of point about stasis and flow through shunt vessels, I think that's really interesting because presumably if there's increased flow through a shunt, then there's actually decreased flow through that phrenic vein, which means that maybe our clot was actually in the phrenic vein. No, I mean, the, the, the shunt is the phrenic vein. I mean, it's, it's that small, short segment of communication between the left gastric and the phrenic, but because the blood is continuing through the phrenic from the gastric, it'll be increased and not relatively reduced, if that makes sense. Sorry, I meant, I meant to say, you know, the blood diverts through the shunt. Yeah. And I'm not sure whether I'm going to get the terminology right here, but the... The section of sorry gastric vein, sort of distal to the flow, the distal to the shunt, is it distal or proximal? <laughs> Probably say a way to, towards the cave or towards the portal vein. Yes, so, so towards the portal vein. Yeah. Presumably that has less flow through it, and maybe that's where our clot was. But the increased pressure and the like, the the pressure changes from vomiting moved it, kind of away from the portal vein and then up the shunt maybe? Yeah, I, I mean, to be honest, in, in, in all of the shunt studies that I've looked at, even those ones up in the diaphragm, we, we just don't associate them with, with intravascular thrombosis. You know, it's just not. Yeah. 
So, yeah. So then we've potentially got sort of two things going on and I agree, like something's causing this captive vomit and that's as much of a problem as, if not more of a problem than the shunt. And particularly, you know, we know that portal venous thrombosis is associated with pancreatitis, systemic inflammatory diseases um, and um, inflammatory bowel disease. So this cat could easily have pancreatitis, as Richard said, or inflammatory bowel disease and have some sort of thrombosis or have had some sort of thrombosis in the portal venous system potentially. The so clot has to come from somewhere. Why not check a B12 um, as part of your assessment for the gastrointestinal tract as well mm -hmm. and see if you can determine more of a cause of the vomiting? Because um, if, like, and are you, have you got access to TEG or anything at the moment? Or I guess like you've got it on um, anticoagulants, but um, just for interest sake, have you got access to any testing for hypercoagulability? I don't, but I, is Christine here? <laughs> I'm sure, sure I could schmooze someone at the uni to help me out here. We'll run a tag for you. We can run a tag, that's fine. Okay, awesome. Um, and as sort of your experience, would you do sort of one on anticoagulants and then one immediately preoperatively, just as a comparison? Uh, yeah, usually with these... Um, with uh, cats or like we don't have a lot of experience with cats but usually we don't see a huge difference in in the normal um tag when we are at least doing it in uh patients on clopidogrel mm -hmm. um, so you don't really see an effect on the um on the normal um tag um what we could do is um do platelet mapping um so we can actually test the the adp receptor um but I guess, I guess just the normal take would probably be sufficient in that case because that gives you more of an idea what's happening um, in, in the cat overall. Oh, assessing the clopidogrel effects. Yeah. Okay, awesome. And what's the time frame, Christine, on running that? You like to run them fairly. Um, it has to be a very fresh sample, doesn't it? Yeah, it has to be run within two hours after collection. Okay. All right. Well, how fast can you drive from Terry Hill to Camp Down? I think I might drive with the cat in the car. <laughs> Get the sample there. Um, all right. Well, Christine and I will work out logistics and next round I'll give you an update on how the tag went. Sounds good. And I guess the, obviously there's contraindications to long anesthesia and, and doing multiple procedures at a time. But if the cat's stable under anaesthetic. Do we biopsy the gastrointestinal tract and pancreas at the same time, given this history of chronic vomiting? And my instinct is yes, before anybody tells me their opinion. Yes. Yes. I want to give it a diet trial before I cooked up biopsies and as Amy said, check B12. Um, the cat's actually been on ZD long term. So I feel like it's done the diet trial. And it's on the ZD for chronic vomiting? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, and the last sort of section of that question, do we do the gut biopsies before ligating the shunt because of the changes that congestion might cause in the gastrointestinal tract? Or do we do it after only if the anesthesia is stable? I think ligating the shunt would be the part, like maybe it's more about going in and dealing with what is the most important goal. Okay. Anna, did you see that um, message from Jeff? Are you seeing the messages popping up? No, 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 I can't see them. Can someone read it out to me? So Jeff. Jeff's saying, yes, pursue the obvious question mark and look for trioditis. Yeah. And then Theo saying, do the radiologist give other differential diagnosis, then thrombus for the filling defect? Can that be a vascular mass? Oh, good question. Let me just 
stop screen sharing and open up the CT report again, just to give you. Can I just point out that that's one of our medicine nurses and how awesome is she for still keeping like the medicine specialist in line after hours? <laughs> 24 <laughs> seven. <laughs> um, all right. Let me find this CT. Um, I might actually, does anybody have any objections if I um, like reply all to the rounds email with this CT report? I don't want to pepper you all with um, too much information, but if everybody's got a bit more time to kind of review it themselves. Um, Mateo, there really wasn't um, any additional like, differentials. This, is, this was pulmonary thromboembolus. And he couldn't say for sure that that, throm that embolus was a thrombus, I guess. Um, and that's one of the reasons we did the heartworm antigen and antibody titer in this cat, just in case there was a, like a parasitic em emboli. Um, but having ruled that out essentially with, with negative result, I think um, a thromboembolus was the only real differential. Um, and I think the other reason for, for that was that there was changes on the contralateral side as well, um, consistent with multiple small thromboemboli, um, which would be very unusual to have that with no nodular change in the lung. Um, we just got another comment coming through from Richard, who's pretending to be Amy. Um, so perhaps whilst the portosystemic shunt isn't the catalyst for the shunt, it might enable a portal vein, vein clot from pancreatitis to end up in the right heart and right pulmonary artery. Richard, that's what I'm thinking as well. So the clot, not necessarily in the shunt itself, um, but in the portal system somewhere. And then the, the change in pressure with that increase in frequency vomiting might have dislodged that clot and had a bit of... Um, backwards flow in the portal system and ended up going through the shunt because it has, it just has to have come from somewhere and it's probably, it's big enough to have not come from this cat's legs, I think. Anna, I have two questions. Hello, I'm Jane. Hi, Jane. Hi. Um, so our first question is, um, have you tested for a lung worm in this cat? Um, no, I haven't actually. Um, no. It's not typical, but like I am just wondering whether it's worthwhile doing that before going into surgery. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll put it on my list. Um, as far as the kind of, I'd have to probably revise the life cycle of, and migration patterns of lungworm. Um, but they normally don't go through the vasculature, do they? I don't think so, but like, I'm just wondering like with interstitial lung pattern and I guess like, could it still cause parasitic um, thromboembolism? But I, again, like I don't, I don't think it, it is like one of the common cause of a PT, but I, I, I'm just wondering whether it's worthwhile doing it. I think it's a really interesting point because I, what I haven't really talked about is could this be a PTE associated with a local inflammatory process? So asthma or um, any other cause of, of local inflammation. So lungworm, pneumonitis, toxoplasmosis, um, pneumonia, um, you know, there's a whole heap of causes of local inflammation, which could have contributed to local clot formation. Um, just because of the local local clot formation tends to be more peripheral and more in small vessels um, because the inflammation outside of the, the vascular system, the, the, vessels, the vessel walls have to be kind of pretty thin for that inflammation to contribute to clot formation within the vessels. Um, it would be very unusual to get such a main stem, main, um, like the trunk of the pulmonary artery um, 
clotted in that situation, but not completely out of the question. Um, my understanding of the kind of mechanism of the way that lungworm could cause this is not by the actual parasitic embolus, but by causing inflammation, which would predispose to um, thrombosis. Um, so I couldn't rule it out 100%, but it doesn't quite fit with this kind of really sudden onset, like no kind of longer term pulmonary signs, really sudden onset um, respiratory distress, which fits more with an embolic, a kind of sudden embolic um, thromboembolic event rather than um, a sort of slower inflammatory accumulation and th local thrombosis formation. Does that make sense? Yes, um, thank you. Um, now, my second question is that um, I also have a recent case where um, the, um, the patient is on anticoagulants um, and then um, we didn't know when to stop anticoagulant before surgery um, and the dog ended up having um, thumbus in his vein after the surgery because um, of a consequence of stopping the anticoagulant about four to five days before the surgery. Um, so I guess I, I don't like the answer to that question is I don't know, but um, have you, even though you, you guys don't have tech, um, have you thought about um, doing um, the PT three hours after um, river Roxley band uh, administration to monitor the therapeutic range of the drug? Um, I think that's actually a really good idea. The, unfortunately, the PT is just not, it's not very sensitive and kind of what we speculate on what is an effective, um, you know, we sort of say, okay, well, let's aim for 1.5 upper limit of normal as our kind of therapeutic target or two times upper limit of normal as our therapeutic target. Um, but that's very kind of extrapolated from human literature. And um, we, just, I guess we, it's a nice theory, but what normal ranges are we going off? What is, our, what is our therapeutic target? And I don't have any evidence to set those targets and therefore I'm a bit insecure about using kind of really fixed targets for that reason. Do you have kind of, do you run a sort of INI sort of, sim is that kind of what you're, what you're thinking about? Yeah, um, I was just going up like, um, I was just reading up about a paper that came out from JVM um, last year about um, how to monitor the therapeutic um, dose of rivaroxaban, um, mm -hmm. and they suggested um, they I think they compare um, the drop level of the drug to um, the um, three hours after administration of the drug and measure the take and PT, um, and they seem to find correlation between the two. So I mean that that's just how I have been. Using using um, to uh, monitor the like therapeutic dosing of my of my dog that I've been managing with the river oxyban. Okay, that's a really good reference. I might um, look that up um, and see whether we can apply it in this case. Um, I think it's sort of it's really good to have a goal with anticoagulants, but um, as you sort of mentioned that three hours afterwards, that's that's great that's what's happening three hours afterwards, but we need this cat to be anticoagulated 100% of the time, um, or at least the kind of majority of the time. And you're almost, things change so dynamically in the coagulation system that you almost need to just have them on two hour monitoring when they're on anticoagulants. So I, I'm a bit jaded about monitoring. As long as they're not bleeding, I'm happy. As long as I don't have to take them to surgery, I'm happy. But this, is, this case is one that I might need to face my fears. Um, there's a couple of other um, comments coming through talking about sort of where PTEs come from. Um, and certainly in humans, the PTEs come from the legs almost always. Um, and that's because of, usually because of stasis, sitting down, people having their legs crossed, um, uh, like sort of particularly in a perioperative period, immobility, um, because there's decreased kind of skeletal muscle induced circulation, um, venous um, return. Um, Liz has mentioned that we just don't see deep vein thrombosis in our patients. And I think that's actually because we don't look for it in our patients. Um, these clots are coming from somewhere. PTE is, in my opinion, massively underdiagnosed and therefore DVT or other kind of um, venous thromboses are also underdiagnosed. And I, I'm interested in Richard's opinion about kind of, as an experienced radiologist, I think we see splenic venous thrombosis quite commonly in systemic inflammatory or local inflammatory conditions. 
portal venous thrombosis is being recognised as we kind of, our Doppler gets better and our kind of ultras, um, more people are using radiologists to do ultrasounds and stuff and have better sensitivity for, for detecting things like that. So I think we're, we're going to get better at detecting clots and our understanding is going to move more towards humans in, in that these clots, PTE is probably quite common. As we do more CTs, we're going to see it more commonly and then we're going to start looking for where they came from and we're going to get more information on that. But they're coming from somewhere. I think deep vein thrombases are more common in people than animals for reasons like getting varicose veins and things like that as well. So... I don't think it's like, I'm sure we don't not see them at all, but I think they're much more common in people. Um, yeah, I suppose some of the risk factors like air, flying in airplanes and stuff, our patients don't go through as much as well. Um, the only other point I was going to ask you is um, in regards to doing gut biopsies at the same time as the shunt. I think whether you did it before and after the same risk is probably going to be that Afterwards, you're going to have very congested intestines, like venous congestion in your, or portal venous in congestion in your intestines. And um, that altered blood flow might put those biopsy sites at much higher risk for dehiscence. So mm -hmm. I don't know whether that's a riskier thing to do when there's already a risk of dehiscence in healthy gut. That's a really interesting point. Um, yeah, I was thinking more about sort of histological interpretation when there's a whole heap of congestion and presumably edema after shunt ligation um, more than the impact on healing. But that's a really good point, actually. I uh, wonder whether we do shunt ligation first, assess the degree of portal hypertension and congestion in the mesenteric vessels and then make a decision based on that. Why not do endoscopic biopsies? Anna? Yeah, it's a good call. Can't get the pancreas, but then we can do that post ligation. That's not not so high stakes if it if it breaks down. And you could potentially do two procedures, which are shorter anaesthetic times. Yeah, good point. Can I ask, um, Anna? Could there potentially be some sort of a genetic component uh, in terms of clot formation? Because I know with people in DVTs, uh, they will then test the family. Um, if someone develops a clot for a factor, for I don't know the specific condition, but a condition um, which you know exacerbates the risk of things like aeroplane flights. I'm just wondering if there's anything like that that's known in small animals. Um, again, we the only real genetic um, predisposition we know of in animals is um, a factor 12 deficiency, um, which is really common in purebred cats. Or I shouldn't say really common. It's it's probably the most common factor deficiency we see and it, it results in a really prolonged APGT on testing but actually in clinical like in sort of clinical work actually causes hypercoagulability um so that this cat didn't have that we tested the APGT and it was it wasn't prolonged enough for me to sort of go down the pathway of looking at factor analysis in this cat um in humans, there's a whole heap of different things like antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, like an autoimmune disorder, which predisposes to hypercoagulability and factor V laden, which is like a familial thing, which it, it can't exist in non-primates from my understanding. So um, APA, uh, the antiphospholipid antibody syndrome I'm really interested in, and I think it's been documented in a few patients, um, canine patients, but um, otherwise, I don't think we, we know enough about the genetic hypercoagulabilities, but I'm sure they're out there. Given all the DVT chatter, in the event that you put this cat on like a treadmill or exercise wheel every day as part of its treatment plan, I'd really love to see that video. <laughs> uh, it's interesting, actually, post-operatively, getting this cat up and about is going to be a main part of it. So, um, you know, it's going to be really important, obviously. Yeah. Ragdolls aren't really known for their athleticism, are they? No, and this one's such a moocher. It doesn't do much. Um, all right. So if there's no more questions, I'll give everybody just the last chance for questions. Um, thank you all so much for making that interactive and asking questions and giving me your opinions because this is, this is a case I think I'm going to ask everybody that 
works in every discipline about um, to get their kind of theories on what's happened. Um, but yeah, it's been great to get all of your opinions and it will be sort of reassuring to go into making a plan for this patient, knowing that I've used as many resources that I have accessible to me. <laughs> Um, and thank you to Paul for doing a great presentation without ever having attended a Grand Rounds before. And Dave for organising. And Royal Cannon, I'm not actually sure whether they sponsored. I hope you all had something to look Yeah, they did. Thanks, Royal Cannon. Thanks, um, and thanks, Joe. I don't think Joe's here, but thanks for her putting it all together. Does anyone know who might be in line for the next one? Or I'll, we'll email around or get Joe to do it. So... Um... We I think can Joe start. might be looking for somebody to take over from her, by the way. Uh, Amy, are you volunteering? No, I'm not, David. Um, I was hoping that one of our young residents might be interested in taking on the role from Dr Whitney. Um, not me. Loving <laughs> 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 at the crickets, Amy. Oh, <laughs> uh, dear. Who are our young I think I think it's on its sash next, if September's the next one. Is it? Uh, 23rd of September. That's if my calendar's up to date. That might be an old roster. I'll double check tomorrow, but if it is, then excellent. Cool. Um, yeah, the Zoom, Zoom format works quite well. I think we, yeah, we might try and make it in person and Zoom if we're ever allowed to be in the same room together ever again. Um, but it just makes it more accessible. Yeah, I think that's going to be life from now on is having to broadcast it as well as presenting, isn't it? So. Yeah. yeah, for sure. I think All this right, is the biggest everyone. turnout I've ever seen, so it's good for numbers. <laughs> I agree. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Thanks so much. All right. Thank you. Good night. Nice to see you. <clears throat> good night and thank you. Good night. Thanks, Jeff.